I'm, so I'm Anna Klaus, and I'm part of that group that um, Renee eloquently described as um, student, co-author, and friend. And um, so I met Mahdi in, I think, 2002. I was working at the Australian Treasury, and uh, Mahdi came um, to uh, do some work at Treasury, and of course we went for lunch, and um, so I was telling Mahdi that I was thinking of going back to school uh, to do my PhD at NU, and she said, come and work with me. And I said, oh yeah, all right, I'll do that. And that was a really good decision. And so um, I became Marty's student, and then Marty left for Cambridge before I was finished. So um, she arranged that I would visit Cambridge to finish off my PhD. So in, I think, October, November uh, 2005, my idea was that I finished my PhD. And so five weeks I was there, I got two days off, uh, one weekend I was allowed to go to London and the rest of the time I worked. And I worked really hard and, um, I, and of course I stayed at Marty's house, uh, Marty welcomed me into her family and um, so I came home one night, everybody had gone to bed, it was around midnight and I knew I had to do some laundry because I had no clothes left so I needed to do some laundry and um, I knew that if I put the laundry um, into the washing machine and I lie down for a bit, I will not wake up because I was so overworked. So I decided, okay, I put the laundry in and I'm gonna wait till it's finished and then I put it on a dryer that I, have something else to, that I have something to wear the next day. And I remember sitting in Marty's kitchen and just wash it, watching the, this was a, like a front loader that took forever and I'm sitting there watching this go around and I think, my God, this is like a new low for me. And, um, but the, the reason I'm telling you this is um, um, because Mahdi was very proud of having made me work so hard. Um, and uh, I got everything done and that was all good. Um, uh, and so one other thing I wanted to say um, about Mahdi, so when I was thinking um, what made Mahdi so special, and um, I think what made her really special, sorry about that, um, I think what made her special is that you, she, she cared about you and she, you, you mattered and not many people gave you the um, show money and I'm really grateful for that um, and I think if we all cared a bit more about each other we would work better. Okay, a different tissue, hopefully I won't need the tissues but I'm here to Jin Chiang and um, fittingly I met Jing at a workshop that Marty organized in Hobart. So this was the 2011 yes, um, Val workshop. And of course there was a dinner at Marty's house. And Marty said, you guys should meet. And um, it, it was a wonderful connection. Right? So, yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you everyone and uh, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to join lots of Mahdi's friends, co-authors, colleagues from the Northern Hemisphere and to celebrate uh, Mahdi's achievements on many, many ways. Um, yeah, so I was one of Mahdi's first hires after uh, she joined UTAS and uh, ever since the uh, interview day, oh, I'm going to crash. <laughs> Ever since the interview day, so Madi mentored me and looked after me as well as my family. Um, just, uh, I thought I'll share one, one of the many, many stories of Madi. Um, so Madi was very excited after I told her I bought a house very close to where she lived. And then she said, oh, I shall give you a present. Okay. So one day, um, so Marty knocked at the door and we opened the door so there was Marty, Ross and the kids uh, with shovels, you know, bags of sand, like a uh, lot of tools. So, so what's this? And she said, I'm going to build a sandbox for you. Okay. In Australia we call it a sandpit, so Renee just pointed out, here they call it a sandbox. I said, oh, what do you mean? She said, where's your backyard? It's so over there. And so then they started all this construction work. And so within two hours, they built a huge sandbox um, for my twins. And after that, you know, the sandpit, the sandbox, 
has been always um, the most favorite place in my house for all of my kids and my dog. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, right, so the paper I'm going to present today is a joint work with uh, Yang Jacobs from the University of Huanggang and Denise sitting over there. And I think um, Denise and Yang will agree with me that the team of co-author got together really because of Mahdi. And as repeatedly mentioned today, uh, one of Mahdi's bigger contribution to the UTAS community is that Mahdi used her own connection, invited lots of people here to visit UTAS and helped the junior staff over there to extend their connection, ex extend their network and build their profiles. So um, Yang and Denise, um, they visited UTAS many times in the past years, so we got lots of chance to talk to each other, exchange research ideas and write a paper together. And also the contents of today's talk, I think, also relates to Mahdi, um, associated with Simon and Yang's visit in around 2010, 2011. And because of Simon and Yang's work on data revision using state-space model, so Mahdi was really excited about that type of work, and she sort of just throw me in to this uh, framework. And I learned a lot of from Yang, from Simon, I learned the programming um, of a state-space model with Simon. So yeah, so I feel really special uh, to bring this uh, this work here to present here. Okay, and uh, it's it's a very much a work in progress, and it's our first time pr to present to anyone. Um, so your comments will be uh, much appreciated. Okay. <clears throat> So many macroeconomic theories present distinctive types of um, time variations, and this is a U.S. quarterly employment in construction sector after 50s. And we can see that apart from the time varying, uh, sorry, the the um, upward trending behavior, the within year variation is also prominent. So decomposing those features out of observed macroeconomic series is very important because related concepts such as output gaps or trend inflation, they are the key inputs in policy decision making and the need of using seasonal adjusted series also requires extracting seasonal patterns out of those observed series. But the method of decomposition are often univariate um, using the single variable of interest. However, if you look at the other information, in this case, I've included employment in retail sector, and we can sort of observe some similarities in the movements. So what the paper essentially is about is to see whether using multivariate data can help to decompose, to do trend cycle seasonal decomposition. The literature has already studied multivariate decomposition, but most papers address the advantage of multivariate over univariate is to show the improvement in the precision of component estimates. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> For example, in the trend cycle decomposition tariffs 2009 work, use a bivariate observed component model for the US GDP and unemployment, and the bivariate model produces a more variant unemployment trend and a lower size of Ocon's coefficient. And one of Molly Wang's recent works estimate the US um, output gap using multivariate beverage Nelson decomposition and they found including variables such as uh, in <coughs> CPI inflation and employment rate <coughs> will help to um, capture the booms. And um, McCloy 2017, they, <coughs> he focuses on the seasonality and the trend extraction, and he's able to quantify the reduction in the signal extraction mean square error by using multivariate filtering. But in this paper, we take a different angle to investigate the values um, from using multivariate data. So the framework we're looking at is an observed component model. We start from identification problem of the univariate correlated using model, which I'm going to explain it using next few slides. 
Um, and then we'll see whether bringing in more observables can solve for this identification problem. <coughs> so our standard, um, this univariate UC model, <coughs> is set up in the following way. So our observable consists of a trend cycle seasonal, and the trend is just a random walk with a drift. Cycle is a stationary AR process, and the seasonal <coughs> has this dummy variable form, where psi L is um, the annual summation operator, where F is um, the frequency of the data. <coughs> so this is really just a moving and you sum of seasonality and equal to an innovation term, which allows the seasonality to vary over time. And the Q here is the covariance matrix of these three component innovations. So typically, um, people will assume this matrix is a diagonal, meaning that it's a zero correlation across those component uh, innovations. But we think um, this assumption could be questionable. For example, um, in the construction sector, typically the construction activities, the employment number will go down in, right? But you for reduction should vary depending on the state of economy. And so in the literature, um, papers like uh, Cream Water has shown that uh, empirically there is an interaction between seasonality and the business cycle. And in Wright 2013 and a few other papers, um, they commented that it's uh, very difficult to do seasonal adjustment during the recession. So um, with this idea of relaxing this zero correlation assumption and our team of so we've shown that the zero correlation restrictions are actually over-identifying restrictions and empirically they can be rejected. But if you have a quarterly series and under this specification of AR tools for the cycle process, two of these three um, correlations between the component innovations can be identified. But still one cannot be identified, which means you still need to impose one restrictions to one of them. So in practice, um, it's not always clear right, which one of the three coefficient at what value should you impose the restriction. So this is the identification problem of a univariate correlated UC model for the trend cycle seasonal decomposition. And so specifically what we're going to look at in this paper is to look at a multivariate UC model which allows the um, correlations across the component innovations to be estimated. And in particular, we look at whether and how bringing in extra information can help with identifying those correlations for cross-component innovations and in the application of the uh, decomposing the employment in the construction sector, um, we have we provided two possible specifications so that we can bring in, in an extra series, which is retail employment, to um, be able to uh, to do the decomposition task while allowing the uh, correlation across component innovation to be non-zero. Okay, so um, I'm going to briefly talk about the model and then go through the identification and then application and then conclude. Well, so we, we can just extend the univariate um, correlated UC model to this uh, multivariate case and note that these three component innovations have two types of covariances. Now, so the first type of covariance is for the same component, right? So the, it's a covariance um, of the component of, of the innovations for the same component. And the second type of covariance is a cross-component covariance. For example, um, all those elements on the diagonal places, they are the covariance of the innovations cross-component uh, within the same series. And all the elements of the diagonals, they are the covariances of innovations cross-component and cross-series. 
So a generalized uh, correlated multivariate UC model will not only allow this first type of covariances to be non-diagonal, but we also do not impose zero restrictions to any of these elements for those cross-component covariances. So you can see that there are so many covariances in this uh, correlated uh, UC model, and uh, obviously we have to make sure they can be identified. Okay, so um, we check the identification through looking at the relationship between the reduced form autocovariances of the observables and the parameters of the underlying UC models. We derive for the reduced form, and note that phi L here is the AR specification of the, the cycle component, and this AR dynamic can be reproduced as the AR dynamic in this reduced form. So every AR parameters can be identified. Therefore, our focus will be those covariances in the UC models. So we can further rewrite the reduced form in, um, in terms of all those component innovations. So Z is the vector of a moving average process with the order um, which takes the highest order value of these three terms. So if you have a quarterly series and this um, order Q basically is just a, whichever is higher between the P plus three and the four, and that means we'll have Q plus one um, blocks of non-zero autocovariances here, and each of them can be expressed by these uh, covariances of the UC model. So this basically gives us the equations for the identification. Um, to know exactly what's the expression of this right-hand side, we consider just a single case of two variables and cycles to take an AR2 process, and then we are able to uh, derive all of the six non-zero autocovariances of the observables and express them in terms of the covariances of the UC model. So this is just an example, uh, third order autocovariances of the observable of the two two variables and you can see that's the um, expression in terms of the covariances of UC models and this will give us actually four equations for identifications. So continue with that example. <clears throat> All of the six blocks of non-zero autocovariances actually give us 23. So 23 equations and if you count the number of unknown covariances in the UC model there are 21. So necessary condition is for identification is satisfied. Now we check for the rank condition. Basically in this linear system we know we need to look at the rank of this coefficient matrix which is now 23 by 21. We need the rank to be at least 21 to make sure that the covariances in the UC can be identified. So it's we know that this A um, will be in terms of all of those AR coefficients, so that's going to be uh, looking pretty complicated. Um, so we just did a simple numeric, numerical ex experiment by taking just a particular set of AR parameters for two series. and. Uh, the values are taken in the way that one cycle is less persistent than the other, and also there's no obvious cancellation when you put them together. Um, okay, so it turns out that the rank of the, this A matrix is 19, which is less than the number of unknown in the UC model. And that means this um, bivariate correlated UC model is under-identified. So we're trying to think about the reason is under identified, I think it could be because of how we um, define the relationship between these two variables is to say they only interact through the innovation terms of the component. And maybe this form of interaction is simply just too weak for the information to be useful to help with the identification of the cross component correlations. So then that means stronger form for two series to be erected so that one can help with the decomposition of the other. Okay, so what do we mean by more related? So here we gave two examples and both are commonly used in the empirical analysis. One says two series, they share the common cycle process. 
So for example, the second cycle is just scaled of the first cycle, and immediately we get six extra equations for helping, hopefully help for the identification. And I just add the six equations to our existing system, and it turned out the rank of i is 21, so the number of the unknown UC model. And the second example is, while well, we allow the AR dynamics between the two cycles to be different, the cycles the in with restriction, then immediately the number of unknown of UC model drops down from 21 to 15. And then in our numerical experiment, the rank of A is 15. Again, that just says all of those covariance and non covariances in the UC model, you know, including those cross component correlations, can be identified. Okay, this identification analysis could be extended to the cases of common trend, you know, the same trend shocks or common seasonality, the same seasonality shocks. So, okay, so it seems like um, um, if you want to allow um, the correlation cross component when you do the decomposition using the UC models, and then the series need to share a common component. So now we look at uh, the applications. Um, our interest is to do trend cycle seasonal decomposition for the employment of construction sector. And we got the data, employment data, initial data uh, monthly. But to make our application align with identification analysis, we convert them to quarterly by using the last month of each quarter. And we use the post-war sample. The bivariate analysis. Let's just start from the univariate de uh, decomposition to see what result we might get. And I created a model. So I to basically assume all the cross component correlations to be equal to zero. And then I estimate this correlated version, record that we still have to impose a restriction to one of the three correlations. So I just arbitrarily choose the correlation between the trend and the seasonal innovations, make it equal to zero. Um, it's just arbitrarily chosen restriction. So, um, well, what we found out is this: the other two correlations, yes, they are different from zero, but the log likelihood between these two models are not much different. So you will reject, uh, you will fail to reject these restrictions of zero cross-component correlations. So I will show you our decomposition results from the uncorrelated UC model. Actually, the correlated version produced almost the same, like visually the same graphs as this one. So what we see, this is the black color on the top graph shows the trend. And you can see, um, well, after the Great Recession, you see the trend doesn't come down by much, right? So if you read the result, you may interpret it as the impact of a Great Recession is mostly transitory. Right? And then if you look at the cycle, um, very persistent cycle, and it seems there is a little downward trend in the cycle, and perhaps that's not the best estimates you would like to have. All right, and now let's move to the bivariate version. So we focus on three specifications. <clears throat> One is the uncorrelated UC model, the bivariate UC model, uh, which basically just says those cross-component covariances to be the null matrices, all the zeros. Okay, and then the last two specifications are our, you know, very related when we specify two series are very related in the way that they share either a common cycle and a shared cycle shock. Right. <clears throat> I'll show you the uncorrelated version of the estimation. Um, what we see is um, this variation from the trend innovation is really high. It's so much higher than the other one. It just seems that the trend takes the dominating variation from the observable. And um, let me show you the decomposition result. Well, 
Well, immediately, I guess you, you probably you won't be happy about this set of results, right? Let's just make a comparison about the impact of Great Recession. So now this time the trend comes down on quite a lot compared with the universal results, and that probably indicate um, or the impact of Great Recession is mainly uh, transitory. But then you see for a very lengthy period of time, the trend is above the observable and also for the cycle, there is a long period of time we have a cycle below zero. So again, and also this cycle is really highly persistent. So you probably won't be happy about that either. Okay, now let's uh, you know allow for the correlations for cross-component innovations and estimate this common cycle specification of the correlated UC model. So this time, if you just compare the size of the variation from the trend and the cycle innovations, they're actually pretty close to each other. So that's kind of very different from this set of results. And if we look at all those cross-component uh, correlations, and they are all very different from zero. Yeah. And now, if you compare the log likelihood, um, the goodness of fit uh, improves a lot. Okay. So now let's look at the decomposition results. And uh, well, maybe you're happier about this set of results, right? So it looks uh, perhaps more like a cycle. So I should note the highlighted parts are just uh, NDER recession dates. Um, well, <laughs> So the trend sort of comes down, actually, it even came further down than the observed series. <laughs> All right. And now um, the other one, the same cycle. So here, both series, they don't have the same air parameters, but they have exactly the same cycle shock. And a very similar set of results. Set of results. And you can see the uh, similar, uh, definitely much more acceptable. You, you'll be much happier about these results compared with the univariate version and the uncorrelated bivariate version. So, um, yeah, so to summarize, uh, we showed that, um, well, including more uh, information means that the um, correlation for cross-component innovations can be estimated, right? So you really wanted the two series or the extra information to be really related to the series of your interest. So here we've shown the two specifications. One is they share the common trend, uh, sorry, common cycle, and the other is they share the same cycle shock. And then um, you can estimate this cross-component correlation and also um, yeah, so that's one like more series will be more beneficial. And then we did show that uh, allowing for the non-zero correlations it does make a difference estimated trend, at least estimated trend and cycle components. Okay. That's all. I'm just happy I didn't have to present. <laughs> I'm sure that would have made it your presentation. Great. Okay, I'm going to completely reveal my preference in research right now because I have like eight questions. But I, I will choose one first that I, I think is, um, a, I don't know, the one. A clarifying question more. Yeah. So when you said that you went to quarterly data because you needed quarterly for identification. No, I, I, well, not necessary. So we just basically look at the case of quarterly. What if for quarterly data? Because that's a lot of micro series are in quarterly frequency. And then, so we go back to the identification. Um, if it's a quarterly data, you can see this number of non-zero covariances of reduced form is actually less, right? If it's monthly, and then that will be 12 with AR2, so you, the Q will be 12, then I'll have 13 non-zero auto covariances, so a lot more work to do. <laughs> so I so, thought, okay, start from the simple one. I think that's, we start from quarterly. 
but it's not. It doesn't mean that um, only if, oh, this this correlated UC model can only be identified for quarterly. No, we don't have to be quarterly. But if it's for monthly, then you have to go through the identification exercise again. We'll go through. That's right. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. My name is Li Yang. Uh, when we are talking about employment and economy, I always have uh, some problem there. I think employment itself really does not add to the productivity, the same as innovation. So a lot of time, employment is really disservice. So I don't know how do you explain all this. I think people just take for granted the employment is improving the economy, but I don't think so. Because the employment, sometimes they just use employment to do something disservice. That is burglarize, uh, stealing the people's car, or uh, giving you the wrong for force uh, traffic ticket and everything like that, including hospital and social workers. So I don't know yeah, how do you explain this and uh, try to differentiate productivity and innovation with employment. I think you use basically employment to analyze all your stuff. And I don't know how do you get those data, whether they are real, that means productivity, and they were imp improving the, the economy. You know, our government use the economy means your, your job increase, everything increase, it, that's good, but I just don't think so. I, I agree, but I haven't used any productivity data here. Um, and uh, I don't think we're trying to explain use employment to explain the productivity side of the story. Well, I guess you mentioned innovations. So here, my the terminology in for innovation I use basically it's just a disturbance term. It's it's not a technology innovation, but it's just a, a disturbance well, term. You, when whenever you have a job, you say that's innovation, but I don't think that's really innovation. It just means there's a, a some kind of uh, maybe cooperation or partnership. And especially now, they have a public-private partnership. They basically involve a lot of fraud and crime and murder. They just take advantage of everybody else, and including elderly, access and, and bankruptcy. And if we are talking about financial institution, everything like that, they increase a lot of employment, but they don't think improve the economy or the society is well-being. Miss, from a, a time perspective, let's go ahead and move on to the next question. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Th thanks very much for the presentation. Um, I was thinking about some of the uh, first few trend cycle decompositions that you were showing, and um, you were showing that the, the, the cycle wound up looking uh, potentially non-stationary, or at least you get strangely long cycles. I was wondering, did you play at all with different specifications of the trend, like using a smooth I2 trend or something like that? No, we haven't. So we just stick to this random walk with the drift. So we thought that's kind of widely accepted for analyzing macro series. Right, but we, we think there may have been uh, changes in the potential growth rate. Right. Uh, for some of these series during that time, possibly as a result of demographic changes. The, the other thing that might also uh, affect the fit of the trend series, and I'm not suggesting you want to go this route, but I've, I've seen other papers where they argue that putting stochastic trend shock can help you uh, pick up large recessions better to handle things like uh, 2008, et cetera. Just, just a thought, but I think it's step, right? The next extension is to go to the stochastic volatility part. Once we figure out you know, the identification, the estimation for this constant volatility case, yeah, 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 certainly. Thank you. Um, 
very quickly, uh, identification could come from variation in variance. So therefore, actually, it, uh, I just thought very quickly that it doesn't follow. Anyway. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Have yeah. yeah. that in I mind. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So actually, also building on that, I, I think it's interesting that you chose construction as your employment series. You know, if we're thinking about series that potentially have you know, unusual you know, trend patterns due to, to demographics and, and the shifts, um, as well as thinking about, I, I'm assuming you chose it because of its interesting seasonal patterns. Is that, or why, why well, was yeah, that? Yeah, so because I thought that there are several like uh, big sectors, right? So always the construction, retail, traffic, you know. So I just said, okay, grab one of them and uh, let's play with it. Really, no, there's no choice processing <laughs> it, but uh, if I look at the literature, people doing the construction, uh, doing the employment data, construction is always one of it. Yeah. So I said, okay, that's a, kind of a big part of the sector, big sector, so I would choose it. Cool, yeah, I, I would love to just see how it performs for others. And sectors. also, um, I think the literature has shown that the um, seasonality between the construction and, and the retail, because they are totally two different sectors, so the seasonality <coughs> actually are uh, not correlated, which is one of the results we show here as well. So there's, a, you know, you can find the consistency <coughs> of the results with the literature. So, so that's, that's you know, part of reason we choose the construction and use the retail to see if the retail employment can help. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.